Good day. Well, here we are, uh, basically seven, eight days from Christmas. And I just want to take this time at the beginning of our time together to uh, wish you, on behalf of Redwater Alliance and my wife Patricia, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I pray and hope that your Christmas this year will be a joyous one. A joyous one and uh, that your new year will bring you goodness in your life. Thank you so much over this past year for, for joining me on, on, on uh, maybe a weekly basis or the occasional time uh, as I bring from the Bible what I believe would be a message from God to us. So thank you very much for inviting me into your places today. And it seems like just yesterday, but four weeks ago, we began our Advent preparation as we opened our Bibles uh, into the New Test, Old Testament, pardon me, beginning with the weeping prophet, uh, Jeremiah. We followed that, up, followed that up with Malachi and last week, Zephaniah. And today we are uh, in the book of Micah with the prophet Micah. And each of these prophets faithfully proclaiming the word of the Lord in their time and context to the people of Israel. Four faithful prophets of God that we examined uh, just ever, ever so briefly, spanning 307 years of Israel's history and their relationship with God. And we have barely scratched the surface. We really have. However, uh, I hope that you have been blessed uh, God has been merciful and kind to us and brought many blessings along the way. And one of those blessings which I believe are there for us over this last four Sundays or four weeks of messages and Advent uh, is the consistency that we find in the urgency each of these prophets brought in their message to Israel. And two elements really kind of pop right out clearly. And the first one is God loved Israel. God loves his people. God loves the church. We see the very first words that came out of the mouth of God through the prophet Malachi to Israel in Malachi 1 and 2. I have loved you. Time and time again, God's everlasting love for his people called Israel back to himself. They called them to repent and turn back to the one who loved them. It's not that God would overlook their sin. God never overlooks sin. Yet God offered forgiveness and restoration. So one, God loves his people. The second element that we found consistently through the prophets of God, at least in these four, is the judgment of God above, upon his beloved people. Why? Well, time after time, Israel turned uh, away from God. They, tur they turned to the idols, to the gods of the surrounding nations. We see this in Judges, the book of Judges, where we read in chapter 2, verse 12, And they, that is Israel, abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them. Now John Bloom, who is a staff writer for DesiringGod.com, asked a question in this context. What in the world was so compelling about Baal and Dagon and Shemosh and Molech. In other words, what's so compelling about these pagan gods? And Bloom answers his own question. The world around them, that around Israel, worshipped them. So when Israel looked upon these pagan nations and their foreign gods, they observed how these nations had fruitful harvests, that they were victorious at war in their battles, they, they had growing wealth, their families prospered. All this happening while mocking is the God of Israel. So Israel decided that the pagan gods provided the immediate benefits that they wanted. Then Bloom in his article turns to the audience and he asks you and me a probing question. What powerfully appeals to your sin nature to turn from God and to hope in other things? Well, before you think of an answer, Bloom answers that for us. Whatever the world around you worships. You know, Bloom really is right, isn't it? Isn't he? Just as the Israelites turn from God to idols out of covetousness and, f and fear, we often do that as well for the very same reasons. 
Well, please turn in your Bibles to Micah, the prophet Micah, the book of Micah, and uh, we'll be starting in chapter 5, verse 2 to 5a, the very first part of that verse. Chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And verse 5, and he shall be their peace. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this time here in Micah as we spend uh, ever so brief a moment here today. Well, help us to understand these words written so long ago to an ancient people, what they mean and what the ramifications are for us today. Thank you, Lord, that through your prophets, your faithful prophets, the message of God was always present before the people as it is today in the word of God. Help us to do these things to bring you great honor in Jesus' name. Amen. First things first, let's place the prophet Micah in Israel's history. So Micah's ministry spanned approximately 50 years from 737 to 690 BC, give or take a bit there. And when Micah began his ministry, Israel had been divided into two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom with the capital uh, Samaria and the southern kingdom Judah with the, with the capital Jerusalem. Uh, a contemporary of Micah at the time would have been Isaiah, who would have been halfway through his ministry time uh, in Israel. And it was during uh, Micah's time, around 722, about 14, 15 years after he began, that the northern kingdom would be defeated and the city of Samaria destroyed and northern kingdom taken into captivity by the Assyrians. As we think about Micah the prophet himself, like Malachi, when we looked at Malachi, uh, there's not much to be known about Micah other than what we find here in the book Micah. We go to chapter 1, verse 1, and it tells us that Micah was from a place called Moresheth. Moresheth. And it seems from the research I did around this that Micah was most likely a farmer. For Moresheth in the day of Micah was uh, situated in the low hills between Judah and Philistia at the time. And it's, just, it's interesting to note that Micah has been called the defender of the poor or the common man's prophet. And when you read through the book, there is much to support such comments about this prophet, this faithful prophet called Micah. When we look at the book as a whole, uh, the first four chapters of this book reveals God's judgments upon the nation of Israel. It reveals Micah's heart and indignation over the corruption of Judah's rulers. For you see, their decision to pay tribute to the Assyrians to try and keep the peace uh, left many of its citizens in poverty and destitution. Micah, as with Isaiah, saw the absolute wonder and holiness and majesty of God. Micah saw that God was ruler of all the nations. He's seen that and understood that. And that to violate, violate God's sovereignty, to violate his holiness, would bring God's wrath and judgment and eventual doom. Now this all should all sound familiar to us, as we have heard from Jeremiah and Malachi and Ze Zephaniah during this Advent preparation. All three, and even Micah here singing for, for most of the part the same tune. For God's beloved people had turned their back on him. They turned away from him. And as if it was even possible, they had turned their, forgotten the word of God. They had forgotten the promises of God. And we know that God's judgment was fulfilled finally in Judah, the time of the Babylonian Empire, past Micah's time. 
So the question is, where do we go from here now as we come closer to Christmas? What do we do? Where do we go from here with Micah? Well, may I suggest we stop right here in chapter 5, verse 2 to 5. See, when you read through Micah, not only will you hear these judgment words, you'll hear words of judgment, you'll find words like this, remnant, rescue, salvation. Micah reminded Israel of God's steadfast love and compassion as he reminds us today of God's steadfast love and compassion. Micah said, who is a God like you? pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in his steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. You'll find that in the seventh chapter, verse 18 to 20. I've been thinking a lot about that, thinking about Micah and his time, thinking about our time, and I think... For the most part, we're no different in many ways to the people of Micah's day. We're a fickle lot. We have our eyes elsewhere often, maybe elsewhere except on God. We chase after the wind or we chase our tails instead of pursuing uh, our God, our return to God. We blame him for our troubles. We blame him for the troubles of the world around us. And it's uh, really a unique time in, in Christianity today, especially as I think about the evangelical world. We believe so many things about God that aren't true. We teach a lot of things about God that aren't true. You know something like this, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. As if God is your own personal genie, you rub the bottle and you get your, you get your wish of the day from God. The question really is this, do we know? Do we really know what God has done for us? Do you know what God has done for you? Well, I want to start off with an easy one. God loves you. God loves you. Now, do you believe that? Do you truly believe that God loves you? Well, the Apostle John said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. Very, very easy one to remember. Most of us know it. Would this be enough for the rest of your life? To know that God loved you so much that he gave up his only Son, that he sent his only Son to die on the cross for your sin and my sin. That if you were to believe in him, that you would not perish, but you would be granted eternal life with God. God so loved the world that he did that. Well, how about right here in our text? Well, before we, we look at it a little closer, it wasn't too long ago that we, we said this. We said this, that when we read the Bible, we do what first? We pray. We always pray and ask this Holy Spirit to give us uh, direction, insight into the scriptures. What was next? Well, we look to find Jesus in a text. So let me go back to the question. Do you know what God has done for you? Well, let's take a few moments to do a flyover, if you will, regarding God's redemptive plan that we find here in this holy word, this holy Bible. Notice I said flyover. Maybe you've been to an event where a military jets or aircraft have flown over you, maybe in formation. And they fly over you. Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do this flyover. It's a visible thing, but it's very brief. Visible but brief. We're going to do this flyover concerning God's redemptive plan, and it will be visible but brief. And we start with the beginning of human history, and we go to the book of Genesis. And chapter 1 and 2, we, f we find that marvelous story and wondrous story of creation. And at the pinnacle of creation, God created humans in his image. We are introduced to Adam and Eve, and they had this perfect fellowship with God. Then chapter 3 comes along and changes everything. Sin enters creation through Adam. Adam and Eve's perfect fellowship with God is no more. And rebellion against the holy and just God is the distinctive of the human nature. 
And it's here in the midst of this broken and rebellious relationship that we have our first glimpse of God's progressive, redemptive purposes. We read in Genesis 3.15, these are the curses that God proclaims against Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You know, Genesis 3.15 is often referred to as the Proto-Evangelum or the first gospel. And in here we have the two elements that were unknown in the Garden of Eden before chapter 3. As one commentator, what we have here in 3.15 is the basis of Christianity. We have the curse on all mankind because, because of Adam's sin, and we have God providing a Savior for our sin. A Savior who will take the curse of the sin upon himself. Well, okay, I must admit, that's not a flyover. That's a bit of a hover. But we will go now into a full flyover mode. So we fast forward now to the days of Noah. God preserves a remnant of Adam's family and makes a covenant with Noah. Next, we fly over the days of Abraham. God's covenant with Abraham results in the birth of Isaac. And from Isaac, we fly over to the days of Jacob. And God gives Jacob a new name, Israel. And from Israel, we fly over the time of his son, Joseph. And it's through Joseph, a remnant of God's people is saved. And next, we fly over and we encounter Moses. Born a Hebrew, raised as an Egyptian prince. Yet Moses becomes God's prophet as he rescues his people from Egyptian slavery and brings them to the promised land. And once in the promised land, we fly over the time of King David, who was anointed by the prophet Samuel and called the son of God. And then God covenants with David. And God's unconditional covenant with David first reaffirms the covenant God made with Abraham and Moses, and that's the promise of a land. We go to the second Samuel chapter 7, Verse 10, and the prophet, and God speaking through the prophet Samuel said this, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And secondly, God promises David that a son will succeed, succeed him as king and build a temple. And this was fulfilled by David's son Solomon. But the promise expands from there. And again, God speaking through the prophet Samuel in the 16th verse of the same chapter, said this, And your house, speaking to David, and your kingdom shall be made sure forevermore before me. Will be made sure forever before me. Pardon me. Your throne shall be established forevermore. God promises David that another son of David would come who would rule forever and rule over an everlasting kingdom. Well, folks, the fuel low-level light is on, beep, 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 and we must land now back here in Micah chapter 5, verse 2 to 5a. And due to the nature of a flyover, we didn't have any time to stop and explore. Therefore, it's important to note that God's redemptive plans and purposes, purpose was guaranteed to succeed despite the failings of each person in our flyover. Why? Same reasons I mentioned earlier. One, God loves his people. And two, as the Apostle Peter said, God is ready to judge the living and the dead. 1 Peter 4 and 5. So we left off with God, we left off with God's covenant with David. With David. The promise of a son who will rule the kingdom of God forever. Please note with me, notice verse 2. Here in Micah chapter 5, where we read, From you shall come forth for for me one who is to be ruler over Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So who is this ruler over Israel from ancient days? Well, let's drop into the future. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, this was during the time and rule of King Herod. We find this story in Matthew chapter 2. Wise men had come from the east, and they went to see King Herod, and they asked him, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. 
We know the story in the Gospels. Herod was not pleased and assembled the chief priests and scribes to inquire where the Christ was to be born. And they quote to Herod, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So who is the ruler of Israel from ancient of days? Well, of course, it's Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah of God. Micah's contemporary Isaiah prophesied in the ninth chapter, verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. It's interesting to note where the ruler of Israel from ancient days would be born. Bethlehem Ephrathah. We must not overlook what we mustn't overlook what Micah was doing here. We, he is using the prophet's telescope. The prophet's telescope. First, he prophesied the destruction of Israel, the northern kingdoms by Assyria, and then later Judah. And now here in chapter 5, he telescopes long range into the future and says that the Messiah one day will come from, a, from the family and ancestral home of King David. We see this in verse 2. And of all the clans in Judah, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, was a small in comparison. Yet from this insignificant village, the Messiah was born as the angels proclaimed to the shepherds watching over their flocks at night. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in the manger. You'll find that in Luke chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. You know, there's so much more that we could do. Time is not our friend. There's only so much we can do in four messages as we look at the Old Testament prophets regarding the Messiah. We've already looked at Jeremiah, Malachi, Zephaniah, and today Micah. And not only the places we did a visible but brief flyover, but we go to places like the prophet Ezekiel or Zechariah or Daniel. John's Gospel tells us that many were divided on who Jesus was, yet he writes in the 7th chapter, 42nd verse, Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was, where David was born. The psalmist writes in Psalm 89, 3 and 4, You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. And the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 7, 14, For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. So here's the point. See how easy it is to trace the progressive, redemptive purposes and plans of God through the Bible. And on that first Christmas, at the right time, in the right place, not one moment sooner, not one moment later, the fulfillment of God's redemptive purposes was born. As Isaiah the prophet said, Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So folks, here we are. Just short days from Christmas 2022. And we will celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And the question that I have for you is how are you doing? How are you doing? You know, we were challenged, if you remember, at the beginning with a, a penetrating question by Bloom. What powerfully appeals to your sin nature to turn from God and to hope in other things? Boy, we've had a lot of other things to turn to in the last couple years or more. We've also seen a consistent theme through our Advent preparation, and that theme is hope. And we said that hope has three components, didn't we? Desire, object, and expectation. And our desires, for example, fuel our hope. And our hope is placed in something or someone to fulfill our desires. And our expectation is that that someone or something will one day deliver on what our desires had hoped for. What are your desires for this Christmas? Is it a thing? Maybe a new tool or a computer or something like that? 
Or are your hopes placed in a person or persons? A relationship. Maybe a change in your bosses. That's what you hope for in that relationship. You know, if you're like me, the excitement of giving and receiving uh, gifts lasts about 24 hours. And all the wishing I can do at Christmas will not move the dial one click one way or the other when it comes to the troubles and trials our world will face in the new year. And the, and the troubles and trials that we will face in the new year. So where do I turn? Where should you and I place our desires and hopes as we move into 2023? Can I suggest we turn to what Micah prophesied so many centuries ago in verse 4 and 5a. And he shall stand, speaking of the Messiah, and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Jesus once said to his disciples and those that would listen to him, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. John 10, 11 and 16. Where will you put your hope this Christmas? Well, I hope you join me. And together we can put our hope in the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your message today. Thank you, Lord, as we get closer to the day we celebrate uh, the birth of Christ, that all the promises and fulfillment of, Je of, of you, of your word and of yours is yes in Christ. And I pray for those who are listening to this or watching I pray, God, that you would bless them this Christmas with peace. And those who have no peace, I pray that they would turn to you and receive the peace of Christ that is offered. God, you love people. You love them so much that you sent your only Son so that whoever believe in him would have everlasting life. I pray that this Christmas... For those who, do not have, who have not received this gift, would open that gift and receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas and a happy new year.